Cozy Bear slips through with domain fronting. Shamoon's infection methods are revealed. Crypto Wars flare over not-so-lone wolves, but there are some genuine lone wolves out there as well. A network sterilizer is, well, digitally unhygienic. Docs.com's search functionality is temporarily disabled. And remember, if you want to reach the G-Men, it's fbi.gov, not .com. Time for a message from our sponsor, NetSparker. Are your security teams dealing with hundreds of vulnerability scan results? NetSparker not only automates scanning, but it verifies the exploits it finds too. Reduce alert fatigue and improve security with NetSparker. Not only will your protection improve, but your costs will drop, and that's a good deal in anyone's book. NetSparker's automated approach to web application scanning lets your security team concentrate on the things best left to the human beings. Find out more about NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud. Whether you're pen testing or securing your enterprise online, you need to check out NetSparker.com. Try it out free with no strings attached. Go to NetSparker.com slash CyberWire for a 30-day fully functional version of NetSparker Desktop. And by fully functional, NetSparker means yes, really, actually, truly fully functional. Scan the websites with no obligation. Check it out at NetSparker.com slash CyberWire. And we thank NetSparker for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. I'm Dave Bittner in Baltimore with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, March 28, 2017. FireEye offers some insight into how APT-29 evades detection. It's also known as Cozy Bear, that is by general consensus, Russia's FSB. The threat actor uses domain fronting to disguise traffic with the appearance of its being directed to a host allowed by network sensors. Domain fronting has also been used by less sinister organizations to bypass government censorship. The technique is ambivalent. It can be used equally to protect people operating anonymously under conditions of repression and to insinuate espionage tools on behalf of repression itself. Palo Alto researchers have determined how Shamoon spreads its destructive payload. Its operators use a mix of legitimate tools and batch scripts to download it to host names the attackers know exist on the target network. This had hitherto baffled observers, but Palo Alto and others continue to work through the attacker's tradecraft, and that tradecraft is becoming clearer. Shamoon, you will recall, was first discovered in use against Saudi Aramco in 2012. The reprehensible Westminster attacks in London have caused the crypto wars to flare in the United Kingdom. Home Secretary Amber Rudd called for restrictions on encrypted communications, particularly on services like WhatsApp. Her remarks came in a radio interview, but she appears at least for now to have joined U.S. FBI Director James Comey among the crypto-skeptical dead-enders. Most industry observers think encryption solves far more problems than it creates, but it does at times give investigators problems, as it may have in the Westminster attacks. It still appears the perpetrator was less lone wolf than a loosely inspired cell member. Israeli police continue to investigate the motives of the man they arrested in connection with online threats against Jewish community centers in the U.S. and elsewhere. This one does seem to be a genuine lone wolf, the disaffected individual acting out of some as yet undetermined personal grievance. Whatever his motives were, they're unlikely in the extreme to have included jihad. Two warnings are out to the healthcare sector. First, the U.S. FBI has warned that malicious actors are attacking FTP servers to establish access to protected health information belonging to medical and dental patients. The motive is apparently a mix of extortion, harassment, and potential identity theft. Second, and this one's an IoT story, researchers at Schneider and Wolf have found that the embedded web server in the Meal Professional PG8528 is vulnerable to directory transversal attack. There's no patch yet, so if you use one of the devices, your best bet for now is to disconnect it from the Internet. Observers have been noting the irony of a washer disinfector used to sterilize biomedical instruments being the occasion of bad Internet hygiene. It's a pretty common security practice to use a VPN, a virtual private network, to provide a secure connection to your enterprise network when working remotely. Brian Brunetti is president of Route 1, and he says VPNs provide a false sense of security. 
there's a lot of risk that goes with a VPN and a lot of trust. And, and that's where just blindly using VPNs uh, is very concerning for us. Help me understand. So it's not so much that the actual connection that the VPN is providing between the endpoint and the secure network is itself insecure. It's, it's that, that that connection is happening at all that opens up the opportunity for, for insecurity? That's right. So if we, uh, if we walk through the connection process, the first thing is that trusted network that you're going to connect to with your VPN client, they've had to open inbound ports on their firewall to facilitate a VPN connection. But ultimately, the, the, I'd say the biggest risk with VPNs is once that connection is established, you, you effectively have full network access at that point. So wherever that user is, wherever they're connecting from, that trust that's been implied through the authentication process that allows them network access and in both directions. So if that user is a malicious actor, they now have the ability to introduce malicious things into the network. And conversely, they now have the ability to remove things such as sensitive data and information from that network. And so take me through, what are the types of things that you recommend? The first piece is the authentication and confirming the individual is who they say they are. We think that it's it's critical that you identify that the individual using that device is the appropriate individual and that they have the entitlements to do what, the, what you're about to grant them access to do. And then if, if what the user actually requires is that teleworking or mobility or that full desktop experience, there's ways to facilitate that where you don't need to provide them with a VPN. So as an example, we have a technology called MobiKey where it facilitates that secure remote access without opening up any inbound ports on the firewall. And the way that that secure mobility is delivered is effectively that users provided uh, the, the image or the screen of the desktop that they're controlling in the network, the secure desktop. And then we detect their typing and their mouse movements, and we deliver that back to the secure desktop. So we provide the full capability to the user without any of those inherent risks of a VPN. So you're not dealing with data at rest or data in transit with with that approach. That's Brian Brunetti from Route 1. Microsoft has temporarily disabled the search option on Dots.com, Redmond's publishing and file sharing service, out of concern that it could be used to trawl through published documents for sensitive information. Some observers see a problem in the service's default visibility setting, which is public. There are reports of compromises. Users are cautioned to look at and reconsider their settings. Various bad guys are reporting to be typo squatting on the domain name FBI.com. Remember, the FBI is at FBI.gov, not .com. The WhiteHouse.com caused a similar flurry of misunderstanding a few years ago. It led not to the citizenship and policy material presented by the real site, the WhiteHouse.gov, but to an enterprising adult site. And speaking of adult sites, iOS users visiting adult sites are being hit by scareware, the usual you've been found downloading illegal content, and so on. The obvious defense is not to visit such sites, not that you would. And do remember that the consensus among experts concerning both ransomware and scareware hasn't changed. Victims should not pay. Finally, the heart may have its reasons, which reason knows not. But wow, sometimes the heart really goes off the rails, if we may mix metaphors. For your consideration, a U.S. prosecutor in Brooklyn, if you must know, who was involved romantically with a detective, forges a judge's signature on a surveillance warrant so she can spy on her rival in what appears to have been a love triangle. The next time your heart tells you to do something like forge a warrant hack a device, go somewhere likely to be infested by scareware, surreptitiously install surveillance cameras. Take it from our advice, Maven. Don't listen. Time to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Palo Alto Networks. You can find them at go.paloaltonetworks.com slash secureclouds. 
Public clouds like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure are great business tools, but it can be easy to forget that when you use them, security isn't just their job alone. It's a shared responsibility. And we know it's not always easy to share, but next generation cloud security can make it a lot easier. It gives you the visibility you need to control your apps and reduce your attack surface from the network to the cloud. With Palo Alto Networks, you get the broadest, most comprehensive cybersecurity for all cloud and software as a service environments. Make sure your apps and data stay secure and protected. Your customers and stakeholders expect it. Secure clouds are happy clouds. Find out how to secure yours. Get started at go.paloaltonetworks.com slash secure clouds. And we thank Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Ben Yellen. He's a senior law and policy analyst at the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Uh, ben, you know, we find ourselves visiting uh, these online child pornography cases. And as much as the, the subject matter may be uh, unappealing, the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of uh, interesting legal things happen because of these cases. We've got a new one here from the Eighth Circuit Court. Bring us up to date on this one. So this comes from uh, an individual in Nebraska named Michael Hike. He was convicted of multiple child pornography-related crimes, uh, and it all stemmed from an investigation by the federal government using a network investigative technique. Mr. Hike was using a Tor network. I think he was an IT administrator, and as we know, uh, you have to have a, s a relatively sophisticated amount of knowledge to operate the Tor network. He used that network to obscure his IP address and to access child pornography. What he has said in his defense is that the evidence gained from the original investigation has gone stale, and there's not enough hard evidence to prove that he himself was the person who accessed this pornography and who downloaded it on his computer. As part of his defense, he said his daughter was also home. He also said that this was an unsecured wireless network, so potentially one of his neighbors or somebody walking down the street <laughs> right, sure. could have accessed this information. Yeah. The government has said, or the prosecution has said, because this person has specialized knowledge and knows how to access the Tor network, that's what makes him a particularly prime suspect. That in and of itself is sufficient evidence. So we see the situation where a person's professed knowledge, and he admitted that he has knowledge of, of Tor networks, ends up really hurting him in, in a court of law because the very evidence that he knows how to use it, he knows the complicated procedures that go into accessing these websites are one of the reasons that the federal government has good evidence on him. And so where does it go from here? Now that the evidence has not been squashed, his conviction will be upheld. And his only option at this point is to appeal the, ca the case to the United States Supreme Court. This was a federal case made into the Eighth Circuit. Uh, you know, I have no idea whether this issue is, is novel enough for the Supreme Court to consider it. But even so, I think the defendant's legal case here is not very strong. I mean, as a user, you have to download special software. Once you have that special software, you can't just, you know, do a Google search and, and end up on one of these websites. You have to know exactly where to look. You have to know the internet forums where people post the text files that give you instructions on how to use the Tor network to access these devices. You know, even if the evidence itself was stale, that's not in and of itself reason for it to be unreliable. And again, it was the evidence that this defendant himself had intimate knowledge of how the Tor networks worked that particularly implicate him in, in downloading child pornography. So another lesson is you, you, uh, you're likely not as anonymous as you may think you are. Absolutely. I mean, now that the government has learned how to deploy these network investigative techniques, it really cuts into the uh, effectiveness of the Tor network. I mean, you can't fully obscure your IP address anymore. But we know that the government has employed this NIT on Playpen, and this is the second website, PedoBoard, that I've heard of where they've employed this, this technique. And now that they know that it's such an effective tool, I'm sure they're going to be using it on any site they can possibly find. Ben Yellen, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can protect you from cyber threats, point your browser to silence.com.
The CyberWire podcast is produced by Pratt Street Media. Our editor is John Petrick. Social media editor is Jennifer Iben. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.